uh, to back up a little bit, in order to tell you more about how this works, uh, I'll have to tell you just a teeny bit about quantum mechanics. Now, I personally only know a teeny bit about quantum mechanics, but it's fine. It turns out like that's just enough to know to you can learn very little and get started doing quantum computation. Um, so there's basically just a few like um, axioms of quantum mechanics from which everything derives, and I can just tell them to you. All right, so quantum mechanics, axiom one. As I said, these are like you know well understood laws of physics that have been like unimpeachable for a hundred years. So even if they look strange to you, there's uh, I mean there's nothing to worry about. Okay, so axiom one is sort of this: the state of a physical qubit. I'll come back to this term in a second. Uh, is a unit vector in two dimensions. Okay, so in particular, okay, a uh, vector in two dimensions looks like this, a, b. It's in, well, I would normally like to write r2 here, but technically the, the entries of this uh, vector are allowed to be complex numbers, but I always like to emphasize, don't get too stressed about complex numbers if you don't like them. Uh, it's without loss of generality in quantum computation to only worry about real numbers. But anyway, quantum uh, complex numbers. And the fact that it's a unit vector means uh, they, their squares add up to one. Uh, again, I'll come back to this in just a second, but let me continue a little bit. So when you see the, this state, it's sometimes written like this, just as a vector, like we always write, like a, b. It's also sometimes written like this. Uh, a times this thing, zero written in weird asymmetric brackets. This is called a ket plus b times this weird thing, one written in asymmetric uh, brackets. But uh, I'm just here to tell you that um, this literally is a shorthand for this vector, one, zero, and this literally is shorthand for this vector, zero, one. Okay, so physicists invented this uh, notation called Dirac notation. It's really actually, when you get to know it, it's really awesome. It's very lovable. But at first, it's annoying to you. But don't worry about it. It's not going to be a big deal in this class. But as you can see, under this you know, terminology or notation, I mean, this is, of course, equal to this. Okay. And uh, these A and B here are called amplitudes. OK, but what, uh, let me just say a few words about what does this really mean, right? So uh, well, you know, when you're building like an old-fashioned normal computer, you use like some physical thing to represent 0 and 1, right? You have like a wire, and it's got like a high voltage, and that's 1, I think. And uh, the low voltage is 0. Okay, and I don't know what high and low mean, but you have like some physical object that can essentially have two basic states. And you're like, great, I have a physical object with two basic states. I'm going to call 1 0 or false and 1 true or 1. And uh, same story in quantum, like uh, there are different kinds of like, you know, subatomic particles that have sort of two different basic states. Like for example, if you have a photon, like one basic state is it's like horizontally polarized, and that means it can go through one of the lenses in the movie 3D glasses. And the other basic state is vertically polarized, and that means it can go through the other lens in the movie glasses. Or, you know, if you have like an atom with one electron, like one basic state is like the atom, or the electrons like, near the nucleus, and the other basic state is like it's in like some farther radius. I don't really know a lot about physics, but this is what they tell me. And so, uh, you know, whenever you have such a physical object that has like two basic states, then you can be like, great, this is my qubit. I'm going to call one of the states 0 and one of the states 1. But like the, the principle or axiom of quantum mechanics is like whenever you have this physical object with two like perfectly distinguishable basic states, uh, the actual state it can be is any linear combination of those two basic states. 
Okay, so if, if you can have a quantum particle in uh, two different states, then it can also be in a linear combination of those states. That's sort of the axiom. And, uh, right, so you call those two basic states 0 and 1, and then the actual state of your, your qubit is represented by a, a dimension 2 vector. Okay, and this is like some normalization property. Okay, so just in the same way as like, you know, the, you know, the state of like a hockey puck that can slide down like a long track is, you know, represented by like one real number. All right, the state of a photon's polarization is represented by some 2D vector. Okay, uh, actually, although it's traditional to write these amplitudes as like A and B or like alpha zero and alpha one, uh, for the purposes of today, and in light of what we've done previously, I'm going to write them as f of 0 and f of 1. I'm going to call the amplitudes like this. Okay, but these are just two complex numbers. So like one qubit state will look like this, just a vector f of 0, f of 1. These are two complex numbers whose squares add up to 1. OK. Any question? OK. So that's uh, what the state of like one particle with two basic states is, like a phot one photon. But let me extend this a little bit to I don't know, what I might call like axiom 1b, which is basically if you have n photons or two n qubits together, their state is a unit vector in 2 to the n dimensions. So, so more generally, uh, you know, the state of n physical qubits is a vector, a unit vector, in two to the n dimensions. Okay, and uh, today's notation, as you might guess, as I alluded to earlier, instead of calling it you know a1, a2, a3 up to a2 to the n, I'm going to call the amplitudes f of all zeros through f of all ones. This is a complex vector of length 2 to the n, and the normalization condition, the unit condition, is that the sum of all these numbers squared is 1. OK, and you can also write this uh, using this physics notation as you know, the number f on zeros times this object plus the next number times this object plus dot, 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 dot. But this object, you know, this angular brackets object just stands for the vector that has a 1 in the first place and zeros elsewhere. This stands for the vector that has a 1 in the second place and zeros elsewhere. Okay, and in general, you know, angle brackets with an x inside it stands for the length 2 to the n vector that has a 1 in exactly one position, and it's the position that when written in base 2 and 0 indexing is x. OK, and one uh, thing from like a practical point of view or from an engineering point of view, when you're talking about uh, building quantum computers to manipulate you know, n qubits according to your will, uh, one thing you generally assume from like a computational engineering point of view is that you know, when you get your n photons together or your n qubits together, you can initialize them to a sort of starting state, which is just uh, you know, the simplest state, like 1 followed by all zeros. OK, so we assume that you can initialize them um, to this state, 1, 0, 0, um, which is also known as this. Which I guess is also known by the function f, which maps 
x to the nor of x in this notation. It outputs 1 if they're all 0, and it outputs 0 otherwise. Okay, great. So now you know about uh, what can be the state of uh, n particles. Okay, so uh, just like in normal computing, you know, you don't just get your n bits and your n wires into some state of zeros and ones and leave them there. You put them through like a circuit and manipulate them. So now we need to know, like, what are the rules in quantum mechanics for how states can change? Okay, so this is axiom two of quantum mechanics, and it says that, like, a physical change to a qubit. These are like equivalent to linear transformations of states. So it's uh, the linear algebra concept. In particular, some physical apparatus changes the state of particles that go into it. It will change them according to a linear transformation. And actually, conversely, for any linear transformation on 2 to the n dimensional vectors, there in principle exists a physical you know, contraption that will effect that transformation. So, you know, a physical system, like a, it's going to be like a quantum circuit, its, it's uh, action on n qubits is to just multiply the, uh, the state, which is a vector, by a capital N dimensional vector. Sorry, N by N matrix. Okay, so any physical operation that transforms the state of some n qubits together, uh, its action on states is that of multiplying by a matrix. But one thing you can further deduce from kind of axiom one is it cannot just be any old matrix. For example, it cannot be the matrix of all zeros because that would map the incoming state to the all zeros vector, but the all zeros vector is not a legal state because it does not have the property that the amplitude squareds add up to one. Okay, so the, for it to be like a legal uh, matrix multiply, it must have the property that it always maps unit vectors to unit vectors. And uh, there's a name for that in linear algebra. We've seen it before. It means it has to be a unitary matrix. Okay, so it must map unit, unit vectors to unit vectors. Or in other words, it must preserve the length of vectors. And as we said last time, this means it's what the linear algebra people call a unitary matrix. But basically in your head, just think of this as a matrix which is like a rotation or a reflection. Okay, these are like the objects in space, or the transformations of space, I'm imagining real space in my head, which uh, preserve the length of vectors. Yep. Nothing. Actually, everything is always complex, but like sometimes as a crutch in my head, like I imagine real numbers. Uh, actually, one interesting fact is like the, it, really uh, these um, transformations are occurring continuously in time. And for rotations, that like kind of makes sense. You can imagine like a physical operation that's sort of changing a state in time is like slowly rotating it. Well, you might think, like, how do you like slowly reflect a vector? And like, uh, that's possible, but you need complex numbers for that. Uh, but never, never mind. That's like some weird digression that just occurred to me. Um, yeah. So just I'm thinking, you're, you're, you're mentally in your head. I mean, a good viewpoint is to think that like the physical transformations are like rotations, okay, of space. Okay, and so like. Uh, in principle, you can, for any like rotation matrix or unitary matrix, you can build like a physical apparatus 
whose effects on particles, like when you fire the particles into this apparatus of mirrors and lasers and whatnot, is to rotate the state vector, this capital N dimensional state vector, in the way you desired. OK. So uh, well, over the last two lectures, we saw a couple of uh, unitary matrices, uh, namely the basically the Fourier transform matrices. You always had to divide by 1 over root capital N, if you recall. But uh, so for example, here's a little 2 by 2 example. This matrix, 1 over root 2 times plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1. This happened, by the way, if you recall, to be both H2 and DFT2. But anyway, it's a, it's a, this happens to be a unitary matrix. And it's, if you think about it acting on two-dimensional real vectors, it's the rotate by 40 degrees uh, matrix, 45 degrees counterclockwise matrix, although it, it operates more generally on complex vectors. Uh, okay, and it, you know, it, it transforms a, a particle whose state is AB to, well, whatever, A over root 2 plus B over root 2, A over root 2 minus B over root 2. OK, so what I'm trying to say is like, uh, you know, if you're representing your photons by, or your qubits by like photons, polarization state, you can build like a little device that like takes in a photon and like applies this to its state. Uh, another example is this matrix. This is also a two by two matrix, which means it's suitable for one qubit. And it's a 0, 1, 1, 0. That's a unitary matrix. In fact, you can easily see that it preserves lengths, because if you apply it to a, a, a qubit in state AB, you get out a BA. OK, so that does not change the sum of the squares of the entries. And in particular, if you apply this to the vector called ket 0, which remember is 1, 0, and maybe this means like horizontally polarized if you're using photons. Then you get out uh, 0, 1, which is what we called 1, and vice versa. So this is actually like a quantum not gate. But it, uh, it operates not just on these two vectors, but it actually operates on any uh, state by switching the two amplitudes. And as I said, as we saw in previous uh, lectures, more generally, uh, for example, this matrix, the capital N by capital N Hadamard matrix, which looks like some sort of generalization of this 2 by 2 matrix, uh, when capital N is 2 to the little n, is a unitary matrix, which means that, in principle, there is a physical apparatus that will affect multiplication by this matrix on the states of qubits. So I said in principle, but uh, we have to talk a little bit about in practice. So uh, well, on that subject, there's like a simple analogy with classical computing. So like in classical computing or electrical engineering, uh, what's the story? You get together, like, you want to operate on n bits, so you get together n physical objects, usually called, like, wires. And you say, okay, they're going to have uh, voltages, which are either high and low, and I'm just going to call that 0 and 1, so, like, each wire represents some voltage. And then you want to, like, compute with them, right? So you put them on, into, like, some, like, breadboard or something, some physical apparatus that, like, manipulates them and does some physical transformation to them. OK, and these wires maybe come out. And so in principle, uh, for the C, you could actually build anything, I guess, that would take any, imp that would implement any mapping between n-bit strings and n-bit strings. I mean, we could ask ourselves, you know, does there exist like a physical C implementing any like Boolean function? mapping n-bit strings to n-bit strings. And uh, we actually talked about this before. The answer is yes, right? I mean, any Boolean function can be computed by uh, 
a logical Boolean circuit, which can be, in principle, implemented by a physical Boolean circuit. Uh, but you know, that doesn't just mean quanta or classical computation is trivial, because what we normally do is say, like, yeah, but you have to like build your circuit out of little like one or two bit gates. And like what you should do is count the complexity of your circuit against yourself. Like you should charge yourself for how many gates you used. That's like the fair way to measure computational complexity. Okay, so it's true, yes, but you charge yourself for like the number of one and two bit or one and two and three bit gates used. And when it comes to quantum computation, it's exactly the same thing. It's most convenient to like model quantum computation with uh, quantum circuits. And you know, I, I similarly said, okay, in principle, for any capital N by capital N matrix that's unitary, it can be physically implemented. But what you really do is, you know, you try to physically implement it by having a little like one qubit or two qubit gates that you string together. Each of them does like a little unitary transformation on the one or two qubits on which it operates. And together, collectively, the whole uh, of them like implements like one big unitary transformation. But you, you know, you charge yourself for like how many little gates you used. Okay, so uh, again, you imagine that the physical circuits are built from like one and two qubit gates. that each do like two by two or four by four unitary transformations on some piece of the vector space, uh, and you charge yourself for how many gates used. Okay, and just like with classical computation, it doesn't really matter like which like gates you allow for yourself. Like in classical computation, if you just say, Oh, you can use any like two bit gates, and it's not a big deal from a computational co complexity perspective. It just changes the number of gates needed by a constant factor. Same is true for quantum. You can just assume that like any like little uh, one qubit two by two rotation matrix or two qubit four by four you know rotation matrix is allowed. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah, the question is like, why do we constrain them to be one and two uh, qubit gates? I guess sort of for the same reason we do classically. Actually, I guess classically sometimes we allow ourselves like, oh, we'll have like an AND gate that takes in all of the wires. But I guess there's like some physical complexity to like putting, you know, a thousand wires into one gate. And from a practical point of view, yeah, I mean, it's constrained this way because it's actually challenging in real life to like build these uh, physical devices that manipulate the quantum state of like electrons and photons and things. And uh, so you really want to keep them theoretically as simple as possible because you've got to try to implement them in real life. Um, so that's the reason. From what I understand for like most quantum computers these days, you, there's many different options for like what sort of physical system you'll use to try to realize your qubits. But I think generally these days, they're really excellent at making one qubit gates. They can pretty much make like a one qubit gate that does whatever you want. And they're like really bad at making two qubit gates, which is kind of believable, right? You've got to get like two photons together and like delicately manipulate them and together and so forth. Um, so like, you know, they're working on making like high quality two qubit gates. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's a valid question. It was like, do we need like an uncountable number of gates to represent uh, every unitary transformation? Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, theoretically, if you want to say that like every unitary transformation could be built up from, you know, one and two qubit gates, well, you know, there's uncountably many, you know, complex numbers. So you would need like uncountably many gates. It would seem. However. Um, in practice, well, not in practice. Like in theory, even you don't really need to have uncountably many gates. Uh, for the purposes, 
for all like you know purposes of quantum computation, it's sufficient to be able to like approximate a target unitary matrix like to some desired accuracy epsilon. And there are theorems to the effect that like if you just want to be able to approximate every like n bit unitary transformation to accuracy epsilon, there's a fixed set of you know like four one and two qubit gates or three or five or something, uh, such that uh, to get accuracy epsilon, you only need like poly log one over epsilon blow up in the number of you only need poly log one over epsilon multiplicative number of gates. I didn't say that perfectly well, but I think maybe you get the gist of it. Um, it's exactly 100% analogous to a problem that's in probabilistic computing, where you're like, oh, you're like allow coin flippings in your in your computational model, right? Like, so do you get to flip like a p bias coin for like every possible real number p between zero and one, and that's like uncountably many different like instructions you're adding to your, your instruction set, like flip one over pi biased coin and so forth. But you kind of know for practical purposes, I mean, uh, if you're going to be running a one million step computation, it's probably fine for your coin flips uh, bias to be like bounded by uh, you know, one million bits of precision. And you can simulate that just by like a fair coin extremely accurately. So it's like exactly the same situation with the uh, quantum uh, gates and unitary transformations. But I mean, excellent point. Uh, great. So uh, now, you know, if we had like ten more lectures about quantum computation, I would just get into this as well, and like, what are the gates that are allowed, and how do you put them together, and what kind of things can you build? But I'm just going to cut that story a little bit short, and say one thing is to like sort of as like a little bit of a, like a life rule. This is more of a guideline, but like, if you ever have like uh, capital N by a capital N unitary matrix that's kind of like simple and like explicit or you have like a nice formula for it, then probably or possibly you can efficiently build it with like a poly little n number of quantum gates. Okay, this is like a life um, suggestion. And anyway, uh, as I alluded to before, some of the main uh, big unitary transformations we want to do are the Fourier transforms. And I will just tell you, those can be done by like very efficiently with only a small, like as a function of little n, number of quantum gates. Uh, so these will just be facts that I shall tell you. Uh, OK, so for capital N being 2 to the little n, as usual. Uh, this one, the sort of Boolean Fourier transform we talked about in the last class, the Hadamard transformation, it's implementable with literally exactly n uh, one qubit gates. And had I really fully told you the rules of like, you know, how qubit uh, gates work like locally to transform space, then it turns out real easy to see that you literally just do this transformation separately to each of your n photons or whatever, and globally and collectively it affects this transformation. Okay, but anyway, take my word for it that you can uh, build like a little n gate circuit that does the Boolean Fourier transformation. So that's wonderful. And we had a different kind of Fourier transformation, uh, the discrete Fourier transform that we talked about in the context of uh, integer multiplication. It's a little bit more complex, but it's implementable with uh, n squared 1 and 2 qubit gates. OK, and like proving that takes like 20 minutes once you know the model. The actual like gate diagram is not completely dissimilar from like the recursive fast Fourier transform algorithm that we talked about two lectures ago, but you'll just have to take my word for it that it, this one is also not hard to do. Uh, great. And it turns out like this is the one we'll use to talk about Grover's algorithm today, and this is the one that you use for Shor's factoring algorithm. Now. Uh, there's one more kind of uh, quantum circuit that can be efficiently built that I sort of need to tell you about. 
which is what I will call, it's not standard terminology, but what I'll call like quantifying, quantumifying a classical circuit. Uh, so here's one more fact. Uh, let C be like a little classical circuit with like n input gates and one output gate. Uh, that's, we consider efficient. So let it be a classical circuit of T gates. Okay, then I'll just tell you it's uh, easy to like look at the circuit diagram for this and write down a circuit diagram for a quantum circuit which does some quantification, quantumification. So it's easy to construct a quantum circuit which I'll call QC of order T gates or T little quantum gates. Uh, doing the following unitary. This will be a very simple kind of unitary transformation. Actually, I'll draw it way over here. Uh, it's a unitary whose matrix is a diagonal matrix. And on the diagonals are just plus or minus ones. And the pattern of plus or minus ones is governed by the output of the circuit. So what I mean is here it's minus one to the circuit on the all zero string. And then minus one to the circuit on the next Boolean string. And the last one is minus one to the circuit on the all one string. Okay, so if you just actually think of C, the circuit as natively outputting plus or minus one instead of zero and one, then basically like C's truth table is on the diagonal. And if you think about like how does this matrix act, um, well, if you're multiplying it against a state matrix here, which is like F on the all zero string state vector through F on the all ones string, uh, you see, what does it do? It just negates some of the amplitudes. Okay, these are the two to the, n, two to the little n amplitudes. And this operation negates some of them, a certain subset of them. That's definitely unitary, right? Because it doesn't change the squares of any amplitude, so it preserves the fact that the squares add up to one. And which ones does it negate? It negates exactly the ones, the amplitudes, indexed by strings where the circuit outputs one. Right, so it, uh, the key thing it does is it negates the amplitudes f of x for those x where uh, the circuit outputs 1. Okay, so you can basically have like a officially build a quantum circuit that negates your favorite set of amplitudes as long as those set of amplitudes are like describable by an efficient classical algorithm. Any question about that? A little bit confusing. Yep. We're saying now that the, that the circuit outputs zero instead of negative one or one? This uh, classical circuit, yeah. Yeah. OK, so now I've told you, like, OK, I said, you know, we in this quantum complexity model, you imagine these quantum uh, transformations are built up from little one and two qubit quantum transformations. And I've just sort of told you that like here are three things that you can do efficiently, like the two kinds of Fourier transforms we've seen, and also this like quantumification of C. Now you might say, what else can you do? And actually I'm here to tell you that uh, Without loss of generality, this is all you need to know. So it's actually a theorem, maybe first proved by like Bremner and his thesis, maybe kind of a bit folkloric, that like if all you knew were that you could do these things, then these are enough to let you do everything that you can do with any efficient quantum computer. Yep. Sorry, what was the complexity for classical? 
Oh, it's a, it's a constant factor blow up. So if C has T gates, then the quantum version of it has order T gates. So uh, actually, when I learned that fact at some point, I was like very happy because I was like, oh, it's great. I mean, in some sense, you can forget about a lot of quantum computation and just remember that like, OK, you can like allocate n qubits, and their initial state is the vector like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then you can do these three things to them. And then you can do the one more thing, which I'll now tell you about. So uh, yeah, what is this one more thing? I've told you about sort of how you compute. Uh, the question now is that, like, well, how do you get your answer? And the sad thing is, like, once you've built your quantum contraption that manipulates states in some clever way, you cannot just say, like, OK, great, qubits. Now, please tell me your state. This is definitely impossible because, as I mentioned, you know, maybe you have 100 qubits, you know, 100 photons together. That's nothing special. But their state is a vector of length 2 to the 100, which is you know, more than the number of particles in the universe. So there's no physical way you could just get their, their whole state vector. But rather, uh, what happens if you want to know something about the state is the subject of axiom 3 of quantum mechanics, which is that when you measure uh, n qubits, I'll come back to this briefly, what this means. Uh, in this state, let me write the state like this, sum over all Boolean strings of the amplitude f of x times x. Remember, this just means the vector that has exactly one one in the x position. Uh, you receive a classical string. I mean, just a regular old binary string. Uh, x with probability f of x squared. Whoa. And then the state, I'll put this in quotes too, collapses. OK, so uh, this is also an axiom. This is like a bit controversial in quantum mechanics, but uh, Basically, in practice, you can build measuring devices which like take in quantum particles, and they have like you know a regular old readout on them, like a meter or like a LED readout, and uh, you know this uh, measuring device reports classical information to you. And when you you know uh, do this to n qubits whose state is given by these amplitudes, then you get back some classical information about the state. Um, and it's probabilistic. You get back the string x with this probability. And remember, by like one of our axioms, these numbers are non, well, these are definitely non negative numbers. And one of our axioms says they always add up to 1. So this makes sense. And this business basically just means that uh, after you do the measurement, the state changes to like a vector that is mostly zeros and just has a 1 in the x position where x is the thing that you read. And basically, this means you may as well throw the n photons in the garbage at this point, because you know, their state has basically been reset to some state that you know. So you, know, you can reuse them in your computation physically if you want, but like, you can't remember anything about this cool state that they used to be in. Okay, so basically, you have like, one shot to like, learn something about the amplitudes by measuring them. Yeah? No, and in some sense, like uh, it's not like you learned the number either. Like it's not like uh, you know, if your state was like 0.8, let's say it's just a single qubit, and it was like this, 0.8 uh, in the first column and minus 0.6i in the second column. Okay, if you have like one qubit like this, and you like fire it into like a little like polarization measurer that has like an LED readout on the side that says either horizontal or vertical, then with probability 64%, it'll read out horizontal. And then this new state will be like all amplitude on horizontal. And with 36%, uh, it'll read out like vertical. 
and it'll go into this all vertical state. Um, and it's true that, for example, if you were to multiply this by negative 1, or if you were to multiply it by i, or in fact any complex number of magnitude 1, then uh, that exact same set of words I just said would be equally true. So in some sense, like, uh, and you only get like one shot at this, so you can't like, you know, keep measuring it and like estimate that like this is something like 0.8 times uh, magnitude one, like magnitude 0.6, like you just get one shot. So somehow you have to like cook up your whole like uh, quantum circuit, your obstacle course for these photons, such that ideally, like the final state vector has like a lot of amplitude on the string which represents the correct answer to your problem. So that when you measure, like that'll probably be the, the string that you receive. So it's somewhat of a tall order, and maybe that's why, you know, there's only so many like known amazing quantum algorithms. <laughs> 